Hi y'all, I am Catherine Belk or Peanut um, with Wild Hope Farm. We are a diverse organic vegetable farm uh, based in Chester, South Carolina, um, about 45 minutes south of Charlotte. We are growing uh, this year on 12 acres. This is our third year in production and we've had this kind of crazy goal of doubling the amount of acres under production, um, essentially to scale up the business and have it pay for itself. Um, so we're growing all different types of vegetables, um, fruits, herbs, flowers, and we've got um, 200 laying hens for eggs, pasture-raised laying hens. Um, we sell our products primarily through a CSA program in Charlotte, Rock Hill, Matthews, and, and on the farm in Chester. Um, and we also do events on the farm and, and do some design consultations, helping people um, <laughs> get started um, on their own land, whether that's in a farm setting or um, you know a backyard garden. Uh, my sister is just walking in. Close the door, please. Thank you. Um, and so yeah, you know, we wanted to open this up to the public because we know a lot of people are feeling um, a little bit nervous going to the grocery store and the amount of food that's on the shelves today. We hope that we can teach you how to get started um, growing some delicious fresh vegetables. Um, some of the information we're going to share with you what's worked best for us and um, a lot of what Sean's um, you know learned honed in on over the years. So. By all means, you know, ask a bunch of questions. Um, we've tried out a lot of different types of uh, farming or gardening, um, and so would be happy to share those with you. Um, so please, you know, make comments as you go along. Um, my mom is on. Great. All right. So um, just to introduce you, uh, we've got. Let's see. And this is my first uh, Facebook Live thing, so please be patient. <laughs> Here we have Sean Yarnicek, who hey. is our farm manager at Wild Hope. Hey everyone, welcome to our gardening class here at Wild Hope Farm. So excited to participate with you on this. Um, I know everyone's probably feeling a little bit of anxiety from the whole coronavirus issue. So um, nothing kind of, I think, what makes me feel most secure in this world is kind of looking out my window and seeing a bunch of food growing in my yard. So hopefully through this process we can help you find security in that. Um, and some of you probably have questions like how much can I grow? What can I grow? Um, when can I grow it? Um, you know, will I, can I, is it possible to grow food for my family? So hopefully we'll be able to answer all of your questions today. If you have any, you know, be sure to post those questions on Facebook and, and we'll get those answered for you. But uh, it's just so timely that we're doing this class right now that we had it scheduled. Um, everyone is, you know, at home, bored, probably wondering what they can do, and hopefully growing a vegetable garden in your in your front or backyard will, will give you something to do, as well as provide you with that security, as well as just help alleviate, you know, supply concerns at grocery stores, and, and potentially join you more with your family and an activity that you can do at home without having to go out um, and, and potentially expose yourself to the virus. So we to create these victory gardens and, um, and do something positive out there. So some of the things you want to consider before starting your vegetable garden is you have to go through your planning process. So that's why we're sitting in our office. We're going to help you uh, start the planning process. And then we're going to go through and show you mm -hmm. things like how to prep your soil, how to start transplants. Um, how to weed, how to control diseases, um, but it all starts with planning your garden. And a great uh, uh, fact sheet for that is the Home and Garden Information Center, uh, South Carolina, Clemson Extension. Home and Garden Information Center has a fact sheet called Planning and Garden. So this is great to, to find online, just search for HGIC Planning and Garden. And you can print this out and it has a bunch of very, very useful information in it. So some of the things you want to take into consideration um, in this planning phase is, you know, how much food do you want to grow? That's a good question to ask yourself. And you can look at um, other fact sheets. LSU has a great one 
on expected crop yields. So you can start with how much food you want to grow, and then you can look at um, the average yields per 100 row feet that they have here, and you can determine how much space you need to grow that food. So that's a great question to ask yourself when you're starting off. So if you want, you know, 150 pounds of carrots, you need to grow 100 row feet of carrots. So, you, so um, ask yourself that. You don't want to grow too much food. It's for a family to plant 20 tomato plants. And then what happens is they have way more tomatoes than they can eat. Um, and a lot of those tomatoes end up going to waste. So you don't want to plant too much. Um, you don't want to plant too little. So planting just the right amount and planting the things that you want to eat is a good starting point. Um, alrighty, so once you've kind of assessed how much you want to plant, you can look at this HGIC fact sheet and you can determine how much seed you're going to need. A seed per 100 foot row. Uh, <clears throat> and other important characteristics parts of this are going to be spacing between the rows. So that's going to determine how much space you need because each plant needs a specific amount of space to grow. So you know how much you're going to produce per 100 row feet, how much seed you're going to need, and you can look at the spacing on that seeding, and then you can look at how long it's going to take before you can get to harvest those crops. So all good important things to consider when you're planting your garden. So the next thing you need to take into consideration is looking at the available space that you have on your site. And you also want to analyze that space to see what the quality is of that space. High quality space is going to basically be an area in your yard that has the most sunlight possible. The more sunlight you have, the better. You have to think of all your vegetable plants as tiny little solar powered plants, tiny little solar panels. And all of those vegetables are going to be absorbing solar energy and converting that solar energy into food for you. So if they don't have access to that solar energy, they're basically not going to be able to produce the food that you want. Um, if you have a partial sun area, basically you're going to be limited to leafy, leafy greens and root crops. Save your sunniest full, full sun locations for your, your, your fruiting crops like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, um, cantaloupe, things like that. Anything that produces a fruit needs the most sunlight and things that are leafy or root crops can usually tolerate a little less sun, but everything will do better with more sunlight. So let's at your, your house site. So let's do a mock-up of your house right here. So some things you want to take into consideration is the orientation of your house. So you have a north side of your house, you have a south side of your house, you have an east side of your house, and you have a west side of your house. Other things you want to take into consideration is the trees around your house. So you might have a tree here, you might have, have a tree here, a tree here. Your house and the trees around your house are basically going to be casting shadows or shade, which are going to prevent those energy. So, the elevation of the sun changes throughout the year. In the wintertime, the sun is very low on the horizon, and in the summertime, the sun is very high on the horizon. So at different times of the year, the elevation of the sun is going to create different shadows, and different parts of your, your yard are going to be shaded at different times of the year. So all of this sounds complicated, but there's a great app that'll make it much easier, and we'll get to that. But in general, the north side of your house is going to be very shaded because in the wintertime the sun is very low on the horizon and your house is basically going to be shading that entire north side of your house. The east side of your house will get lots of sunlight in the morning but it's going to be shaded by your house in the afternoon so it's not going to get a lot of sun in the afternoon. The west side of your house will be shaded in the morning and it's going to get a lot of sun in the afternoon. So usually the east and west side, since they only are going to get a half day of sun, are generally not enough sunlight. Ideally, you want a site that has at least six hours of sun. So really, the best spot for a garden around your house is going to be the south side of your house. The south side will generally get the most sunlight out of all the areas around your house. But you also need to take into consideration trees and what those trees are doing. So one app you can use that will help you determine that 
And if you don't want to purchase this app, I purchased this app for $15, it's a little pricey. If you don't want to purchase this app, you can do it the old fashioned way, which is by doing what's called a sun chart. So um, I'm not going to get into that, it's too complicated, but you can go online and learn how to, how to make a sun chart. And a sun chart, you basically stand exactly where your garden is, and you can analyze the sunlight in that spot using a sun chart to see how much sun that location is going to get. If you want to be lazy like me, get the app, Sunseeker app. I'll click on it right here. And in the Sunseeker app, you can do what's called a 3D view. And what this view will do is it shows where the sun's going to be at different times of the year and at what time the sun will be there. So you can see this green line right here is showing that the sun will be, that the camera pointing from this location, the sunlight is going to be at this spot if the sun was right there at 4 p.m. If, if you get the app, you might want to play around with it since it's hard to tell from this uh, transcription. Yeah, but this basically allows you to use your phone to stand where your garden is and look and make sure that that spot is going to get six hours of sunlight. You can analyze the sun and how it moves throughout the entire year and see how the sunlight will change throughout the entire year. It's just a fascinating, fun app to work with. Highly recommend it. So fun and so educational for kids to get them involved. Okay, so once you've found your perfect site around your house that has lots of sun, you also want to take into consideration access to water and also access for humans. Because if you put your garden really, really far away from your house, I guarantee you're not going to harvest as much from it. And it's also probably going to become a weedy mess because it'll just be forgotten in the back area. So you want to basically your house as you can tolerate. My favorite area to put a garden is if you've got your front door right here and you've got a walkway that goes from your car to your front door. That, I think, is the best area to put your garden because you're going to be walking by it every day. You're going to see it. You're going to harvest from it. Take care of it. You're going to want it to look good because you're going to be seeing it all the time. So that, if you put it there, it will be almost guaranteed to be successful. Lazy farmer tip. <laughs> If you put it back here where you never see it, you're probably not going to put as much time into it that you need to. It's probably going to be forgotten and not taken care of, and you probably won't harvest as much from it either. So take into, get into consideration these areas where you basically spend the most time already and, and try to put the garden in those areas where you're already spending time so then you're naturally inclined to take care of it. A third and final consideration is basically you want to have access to water because your garden is going to need a lot of water. Gardens are thirsty. So you want to make sure that you're close enough to a spigot or something on your house where you can basically pull water from, from your house and irrigate your garden to give it the water that it needs. All right, let me just check and make sure I haven't forgotten anything important. And this is, this is our office in case you're curious. This is what we do most days of the week. Sit around the office. <laughs> okay. Okay, so some other considerations um, planting dates. When you're planting your garden, plants need to be put in the ground at very specific time periods. For example, if you planted a tomato, put a tomato in the ground right now, it's probably going to freeze and that tomato would probably die. So now would not be a good time to plant tomatoes. Now it's not, and also the soil temperature might not be warm enough now for a lot of those summer crops. So you basically have two seasons to your, to your cropping cycle. And in South Carolina, you really have more than that. You have probably three seasons. So you have the spring season, where you can grow a lot of cool, cool uh, season crops, plants that can tolerate the cold. And then you have a, a summer season, where you need to grow your plants that cannot tolerate freezing conditions. And then you have a fall season where you basically can replant all those things that can tolerate the cool, cold temperatures and also can tolerate freezes. Where do you find your last frost date? <clears throat> um, that's a good question. I know... Google it. Yeah, Google it. Clemson Extension <laughs> has uh, frost dates and they usually are um, associated with like a percentage. So there's like a 90% freeze, you know, after this date. Or before this date. And where'd you so, get that list of uh, planting dates? So these planting dates come from that planting a garden website uh, or fact 
sheet. Mm. It looks like somebody shared that on the, on the, John Lupton shared it for us. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Okay, so some things have very specific planting dates. And one of the main problems that I see is that people either plant things too early or too late. For example, if we look at our list here, let me find broccoli. Broccoli, we are in the Piedmont region, and broccoli is recommended to be planted in the spring, March 1st through March 15th. So a very common mistake that I see is that people will plant broccoli too late. And what happens if you plant it too late is that by the time the broccoli matures, it's too hot and broccoli is a cool season crop and it likes the cool weather. So if you plant it at the end of March, when it becomes mature, it's gonna to be too hot. And what happens when it's too hot is you're gonna have a lot of insect problems. Insects what? like harlequin bugs, they come in later in the season and they're gonna basically just devastate your broccoli plants. A lot of times you might get more disease problems if you, if you plant too late because broccoli is a cool season crop that likes it cool and if you stress it out with that heat, it's basically going to have more insect problems and more disease problems, and you're probably not going to be as successful. When, when they say plant, does that mean with, from a seed, or does that mean into the ground with a transplant? That is a great question. And down here, they have a little uh, asterisk, key, which says, you know, number one means transplant dates. Um, so if it has that little one symbol by it, then that is when you need to transplant it. So for broccoli, that would be when you need to transplant that broccoli. Okay, so, so you want broccoli to already be pretty big at that point. Yeah, yeah. So if you're transplanting something, you need to start those transplants about five weeks before you want to put them in the ground. So if you're going to plant broccoli March 1st through March 15th, you basically need to start those seeds and you're, you need to start those transplants, start producing those transplants in January so that they're big enough so that when you plant them in March, you know, they'll be big enough to put in the ground. So in the South, in South Carolina, it's, it's too late to start broccoli right now. Too late to start broccoli, but not too late to go to the store and buy a broccoli transplant. Great. So and, it, and if you live in New England or a colder climate, you might still have time. So just go ahead and, and look online for um, your, your planting dates based on your climate. Yeah, all, the, all this is based on the climate and will vary by region. So South Carolina has three different regions. North Carolina probably has more than that. So you need to make sure that you're planting according to the right time and according to your, your climate. Super critical. Also, the earlier you plant things, usually the less disease and insect problems you're going to have. For example, a lot of people have problems with pests and diseases on their um, summer squash, like zucchini and yellow squash. And a lot of times people plant those too late. You want to plant those as early as you possibly can. So then you can beat all those insect and disease problems. Okay. All right. Thanks. Let me actually take this off. All right. <laughs> so another thing to consider is what variety is going to work good in your in your climate. Work well. Work well in your climate. Thank you. So um, what I usually turn to is the Southeastern U.S. Vegetable Crop Handbook, and they this is an older version. You've got much newer versions in this now, but they basically update this book every year and you can get this book free online, um, a PDF version. So if you go to this book, it's the most useful vegetable gardening book that I've ever encountered. It will have all kinds of useful information in it and some of those things are not only planting dates, they have planting dates in here as well. And they have the varieties that are gonna do best in your climate. So here we've got Alabama, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, and they have specific variety recommendations. So these are the different varieties, and these are the states that they're recommended to grow in. So if you stick to the varieties that they recommend, I find that um, you'll have a higher likelihood of having success because they've tested those varieties out in the states and um, determined that they will grow well in your specific climate and region. Again, if you don't live in the Southeast, just find uh, the, the New England or Northeast or Midwest version of that handbook. And maybe uh, Peyton will send a link to it. Okay, so another thing in the planning process is to analyze the soil. So once you've found that perfect site where you wanna grow vegetables on your, at your house or in your garden, 
you basically want to get a soil test done and see what's in your soil. So a soil test is free in North Carolina, I believe. In South Carolina, it costs $6. To get this done, you can take a sample of your soil, a couple cups, to your local extension office, and they will send it to their very sophisticated lab and do a detailed analysis on that soil to tell you what exactly in, is in that soil. So the most important things you want to look for in this soil test is the pH of your soil and the concentration of nutrients in your soil. So if your pH is too high or too low, your plants will not be able to absorb nutrients and they're gonna uh, languish, suffer, and die a slow, horrible death. Gosh. <laughs> so if you don't wanna torture your plants, you wanna make sure they can absorb those nutrients and be strong and healthy. And what will allow them to do that is to basically adjust the pH of your soil to the proper level. So in general, the pH of your soil for garden vegetables needs to be between 5.8 and 6.5. That will allow the vegetables to absorb those nutrients. Um, if, your, if your pH is too low, you can raise it by using lime, and the soil test will give you lime recommendations. Where do we buy lime? Um, you can get it at your local feed store. We'll usually have it. Um, if you get the pelletized lime, it's easier to spread, but you can also get powderized lime. And if you do need to change your soil pH, it's a very slow process. So you want to ideally uh, add that lime and put that lime into the soil deeply because it's not going to move into your soil very quickly. You need to basically dig it in and till it into your soil or dig it into your soil so that it can have that reaction. And that reaction takes several months. So um, once you get your soil uh, pH tested, adjust it with that lime as soon as possible um, uh, and ideally several months before you're planting. If you need to lower your pH, a lot of times they will recommend sulfur and that will, will lower your pH. But in general, the pH is usually too low and needs to be raised. There are some situations, especially if you have a brick house where they might have you know, dumped mortar or some kind of concrete material out there that created um, a very low pH situation around your house, but in general, the pH is a, or a high pH situation in your house from that mortar. But in general, the pH is too low and needs to be raised. So, um, and then you need to look at your, your, the major nutrients that are lacking in your soil. And if any are lacking, um, like below the sufficient range or below the high range, then you might need to add some of those major nutrients so that the plants have what they need. However, you don't want too much of any one thing. If you have too much of one thing, like if you have too much phosphorus, then you're going to have deficiencies in other areas. If we're, if we're anxious to get started on our garden, do we still need to do a soil test? I would. Um, it's not necessary, especially the technique that I'll show you, the sheet mulching technique with the composting, but it's still going to be a good idea to get this soil test done. Um, I think over the long haul, adjusting the pH of your soil and getting that right. Um, so do the soil test, but you can continue to plant this year anyways. Yeah, continue to plant. Um, you just might need to add more compost to basically, compost is always going to be neutral. So if you add a lot of compost to your soil, that will basically bring the pH up regardless of, of what your soil pH is. Great. Okay, so that's a little, little cheat sheet there. All right, so we've assessed the solar energy. So another consideration is, is irrigation. Before we go outside and do the outside activities, let's look at how to create a simple drip system for your garden. Okay. And um, because irrigation is gonna be a very, very important thing to, to your success. This is our pack shed or our wash and pack station. So um, they're not, you know, as clean as they would otherwise be. Please don't mind the mess. Okay. So when it comes to irrigating your garden, uh, you can always do it with a hose and a nozzle on your hose to break it up so it's not a, a really strong stream that's going to damage the plants. But I find a lot of times, um, whenever I've tried to hand water in my garden, I usually do not give it enough water. Don't give it the water that it needs. The roots on the plant need to go about 12 inches deep. They are gonna go about 12 inches deep. 
So when you irrigate, you really need the water to infiltrate into the soil to that depth. If it's not getting to the depth of the root system and it's just staying on the surface, you're not going to have a very strong plant. So it's important to give them enough water. And it's amazing how long it takes. If you're just watering a small area, you might have to stand there for 10 minutes irrigating to give that garden enough water for that soil to sink down. So if you are hand watering, it's very important to put your finger down in there, dig down in the soil, and make sure that you're giving it enough water, and make sure that you have enough time to give them the water that they need. So without that, um, those are cheap, easy to do. You can um, and you can connect a hose bib timer to your hose bib. So um, before you connect your hose to your spigot, you can basically get a little battery powered timer. I don't have one to show you. Where do you get those? Um, you can get them at Lowe's or Ewing Irrigation. If you want to get a higher quality one, you can go to specialty irrigation place like Ewing and get a higher quality timer. And then if you really want to go high tech, you can get a, a plug-in timer to your wall and run control wires to a valve that's underground and we can show you that on the field. And then irrigation system. But that's a little uh, beyond what we're gonna talk about today. Are there, are there any plants that you might overwater that don't need much water? Um, no, in general, vegetables need about one inch of water a week. In the heat of the summer, they might need one and a half inches of water a week. Um, so if you're using an overhead irrigation system, you can put a rain gauge out there, you can put a tin can or something like that that will catch the water where you're irrigating to make sure that when you are doing that irrigation, you're giving them you know, at least a half inch of water at each irrigation, and you want to give them over the, that entire week, you want to make sure that they're getting that one to one and a half inches of water in the summer. Great. So they'll be successful. Um, however, overhead irrigation can cause a lot of problems. Um, whenever you get the leaves wet on a plant, um, you're going to be more likely to get disease and disease issues. Uh, diseases like fungal diseases and bacterial diseases, those fungal diseases thrive on wet leaves. The longer those leaves stay wet, um, the more likely those diseases are to grow and spread on those plant leaves. So if you are going to overhead irrigate, the ideal time to do that overhead irrigation is in the middle of the night, because what happens in the middle of the night is dew is going to get on those leaves. So every night if there's dew on those leaves, those leaves are already going to be wet. How are you overhead irrigating in the middle of the night? Well, that's when a timer comes in. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have that hose bib timer, um, it will be able to turn that on in the middle of the night and irrigate your garden um, when it doesn't really matter, when those leaves are already wet. So if you're, the leaves are getting wet in the middle of the night, they're already wet, so you're not basically extending the time period that they're wet. So a bad time to water would be when the plant leaves are normally drying off, so the dew sets on at night, and then the morning time that dew is drying off, and then the plants are all dry through the day. So the worst time to water would be when the dew is normally drying off, and if you water then and extend the time period that the leaves are wet, then that is a bad idea because then the leaves are going to be wet for a longer period of time. The timer, the fancy timer, and we want to water during the day. What time so do I water? The best time is to let the leaves dry out and then irrigate in the middle of the day um, and then let the leaves dry out again before you, the dew sets on them at night. So you basically, the best time, if you did have to water in the, in the middle of the day, would be, you know, before that dew sets in and give your plants as much time as possible. So what time is that? To dry out. So like 12, 12 would be ideal. Okay. Lunch. Come home at lunch, water your plants. Okay, but what's better, because overhead irrigation is going to waste a lot of water, because when you overhead irrigate, a lot of that water moisture is just going to evaporate into the air. So it's not very efficient. You know, might have 50% efficiency where you're losing half the water to the atmosphere and um, half the water to areas around the plants that they're not going to have access to and use. And then uh, only uh, half that water might get to your plants where your plants can actually use it. So one way to basically conserve water is to use a drip system and a drip system also solves the problem of, you know, not getting your leaves wet. If you don't want to get your leaves wet, you can very easily do that with the drip system. So drip systems are super easy to build. So it starts, I'll teach you how to do it from a hose bib. So it starts by getting a connector right here that converts it from hose bib thread to pipe thread. So hose bib thread is a wider 
and hose bib thread always has a washer. If your hose bib is leaking, it's probably because it's missing. If your hose is leaking, it's probably because it's missing this washer. So hose bib thread will have a washer on it. Pipe thread does not have a washer, and it's slightly narrower and closer together. The threads are closer together than the hose bib threads are further apart. So we need to convert. If you want to plug this into your hose, you have to convert from your hose to your pipe thread. And if you're using a drip system, the water is going to be passing through really small holes. So you need to make sure that you filter that water before it hits those small holes so it doesn't clog those small holes. So basically, you need to pass the water through a filtration system. So here's the filter and this, and, and that needs to be cleaned out occasionally depending on how dirty your water is. All right, so this filter has pipe thread on it, and whenever you use pipe thread, you need to basically seal that pipe thread with not a washer, but with Teflon tape. So you take the Teflon tape like this, and when you put the Teflon tape on, you basically want to make sure that you're, if you're facing down the end of the pipe, that that Teflon tape is going around in a clockwise fashion. It's all right. You don't have to do it. Okay. This is fun part. <laughs> Feel free to ask questions as we go along. Okay. So we got our Teflon on there. You only need to put it around two to three times. You might crack the pipe. Okay. So we've got our Teflon tape on there. Now we're going to screw that fitting onto our filter. Okay, and drip systems um, require a lower amount of pressure than you usually have in your house system. So what you need to do is you need to reduce that pressure so that you don't blow your drip system apart. So you filter the water and then you pass it through a pressure reducer and that's this gray piece right here. So we screw on, that requires a Teflon tape too. Screw that on and that will reduce the pressure depending on what kind of drip system you have, it's going to require different amounts of pressure. So the drip system I'm going to be showing you today, 30 PSI is good for that drip system. And that will just ensure that all these fittings will work and you're not going to as soon as you turn it on. So this reduces the pressure. And then we need to use this fitting here that screws in. It's pipe thread again, so it requires a Teflon tape. That screws in go from your pressure reducer to your drip tubing. So here we have some drip tubing, and this is half inch drip tubing. It's a half inch fitting here, and these fittings you basically just push them in like this. If you have a hard time pushing this in, put it out in the sun and let the sun heat it up. Or you can use a blow dryer, and that will make it easier to push that in. So to get to your garden, this half inch tubing is really cheap. Get 500 feet of it for 50 bucks or so. Um, to get to your garden, you might need a T or some other kind of fitting or an elbow. But basically, you want to go from your hose and then have this tubing go all the way to your garden. You can bury this tubing if you want to not mow over it and damage it. And then once you get to your garden, you can basically, there's, you've got several options. You can use emitters, and this is an emitter right here, and this emitter basically can be punched into the tubing, like that. Just push it in, and if you have a hard time pushing it in, you can use a punch like this to pre-punch a hole. Where do we get those guys? Um, I would recommend getting these, the, these kind of supplies at Ewing Irrigation. Or if you don't live um, in Charlotte. Uh, Lowe's, you know, uh, is a great place. Home Depot will have these kind of things. But the important thing is, is to always get your irrigation supplies from the same place because every irrigation place usually has a slightly different size tubing. So a half inch at Ewing might be different than a half inch at Lowe's. And then when you go to put in a fitting from Lowe's, it's not going to work with the Ewing tube or the fitting from Ewing is not going to work with the Lowe's tube. So you always want to stick with the same irrigation place because half inch might not mean the same thing. Okay, so you can punch in these emails. Um, 
if this tube is too far away from the plant, you can basically put a small piece of tubing onto this called spaghetti tubing or quarter inch tubing, and that will get it from this emitter to where your plant is. So that's one way to do it. And if you have a lot of plants or if you have a, you know, a long vegetable row, you can get the quarter inch tubing that has emitters inside of it, inline emitters are called. So to attach those, you want to use a special emitter called a connector. And this basically, these emitters reduce the flow, so depending on what kind of emitter you have, a specific amount of water comes out. So this one's rated one gallon per hour. So only one gallon of water will come out of this hole right here over an hour period of time. But this connector, it doesn't basically reduce the flow. Water will just shoot out of it. So if you're using this tubing that has inline emitters in it, this is the type of connector that you're gonna to wanna to use. So you can basically punch this in to your tubing like that. And then you can put the quarter inch tubing here like that and then at the other end you can run this out and with this type of tubing you can usually only run it about 15 feet depends on how close the emitters are spaced and then at the very end of that run you want to put a little plug to stop the flow so it's as simple as that uh, let's see what else in here. You can also get valves that you can put on here if you want to create different zones. And to hold all this tubing down and keep it nice and tidy and close to the ground and in place, you can either bury it or you can use what are called sod staples. These are typically used to hold sod down when you're putting a lawn in your house. So these will go into the ground and will hold this tubing down close to the ground and keep it nice and tidy. Great. All right, any questions on that? And one other thing you can punch into this, if you want to do overhead irrigation, you can punch in misters and you have misters that you just have these stakes that go into the ground and these have, you can get different heads on them that are 180 degrees, 360 degrees, 25 degrees, different uh, styles. And then you can also turn these on and off with little valves, so very cheap way to overhead irrigate your garden as well. Overhead irrigation is great if you're direct seeding plants into the ground. Um, those seeds will be much more likely to germinate if you overhead irrigate because with the drip system, you're just wetting a very small area. So um, you might not wet the entire surface of the soil uh, where those seeds are located. Okay. All right, any questions on drip? My hand. All right, we'll and meet you in the greenhouse. Sounds good. That was for sound. We have that shed door closed. Oh. Sorry, friends. Um, just to show you, there's a high tunnel there. Um, field one is beyond that compost pile. Um, mostly it's in cover crop right now because a lot of our, our um, spring stuff is in field three, which is a lot of days away. But you can see over there we've got a, a few things growing. We'll go check that out. This is our shade house, a little plant nursery. About, about this. We've got some bald cypress that we're growing that we're going to propagate there. Um, compost tumbler here. These things are great. Highly recommend buying one. Um, and then here we are in our hopefully quieter greenhouse because someone's out mowing a lawn. Um, and you can see it's pretty full right now. And we use these trays that um, these things are called speedling trays. They're styrofoam, which we don't love, but they fit perfectly in our, into a mechanical transplanter. So, um, and we're able to reuse them year after year, which is awesome. And you can just see, you know, we always try to keep track of the date that we seeded um, and the variety. So this is Bambi lettuce. Um, 
And then we've got some ginger uh, that we are growing here that we're going to put into our high tunnel. So, anyways, that, that, that's farmer Rachel over there. Hi! Um, she's going to be Sean's handy woman. I'm the demonstrator. She's the prettier side of things. <laughs> All right, so uh, now we'll move into teaching y'all how to uh, start your transplants. Um, transplanting, starting plants from transplants, a lot of times can be helpful because, for example, if you need to plant broccoli March 1st through March 15th, um, and you just plant the seeds in the ground, the broccoli might not have enough time to mature before it gets too hot. So by starting it earlier as a transplant, that enables it to get to that mature stage before the heat hits in our climate. Same thing goes for playing in the fall. If you start it, you know, early enough, you can get into the ground. Um, transplants also give you a head start on weeds. You know, if you put a seed in the ground, if there's any weed seeds in that ground area too, those weeds are going to start germinating whenever you water that soil. And if you have your, your seeds in there, those seeds are going to germinate when those weed seeds germinate. If you put a transplant in the ground, that transplant has been growing for five weeks, so it has a huge head start on any weed seeds that are out there that might germinate. Like these scallions here. Yes, so it's have a huge head start. Okay, so uh, one important factor in starting your transplants is potting soil. Uh, once you containerize the plant or put it in a pot, you're basically blocking its access to very important things that it needs. Some of the most important things that it needs when you containerize it is it doesn't have access to moisture anymore and it doesn't have access to air. So those are two things that those plants need very badly. So potting soil overcomes those things by giving them a massive amount of, by, yeah, by being able to hold on to a lot of water and also by applying a lot of air. So you can't just like go out and dig some soil up from your property and think that that's going to be good potting soil because it's not going to have the specific composition to basically give the plants the moisture and the air that they need because you block those things off with that container. So typical potting soil ingredients are things like peat moss or coir fiber. Peat moss is, is mined up north. Coir fiber comes from coconuts. But this peat moss, as you can see on the package here, it holds 20 times its own weight in water. So this is like a giant sponge. This is going to be able to hold a lot more moisture than just typical soil that you'd find on your property. That is, and that is why it, it makes such a very good potting soil ingredient. Um, for air, a typical potting soil ingredient is perlite. So perlite is a mine substance that's heated up and then it pops like popcorn and it's got a lot of pore space in it and it basically adds a lot of air to your potting soil mix when you mix those things together together the peat moss will basically be able to absorb the moisture and the perlite will add and it'll give your plants access to that oxygen that you've blocked off with your container so in our potting soil mix we also use 50 percent compost Rachel, will you get our, our um, potting soil ingredient list so I can show people everything yes. that we put in there? Sure. Over here. Over here. Okay. Um, so we also mix in, uh, and 50% of our potting soil mix is made from compost, and compost also absorbs moisture and ingredients, uh, but it also adds a living component. It's got a lot of things that are living in it, and that living component can be beneficial because you're trying to create that good biology. So we use different rates of all these different products, and this is the formula that I find works best for me. And we'll send it to y'all. Yeah. So it's basically, you know, 50% of our mix is compost, and then 25% is perlite, 25% is peat moss, and then the peat moss is very acidic. It's got a low pH, so we add a little bit of lime to raise the pH up, and then we add a little bit of fer fertilizer to our mix as well. And for your fertilizer, let me grab ours. It's got a hole at the bottom. <laughs> you want to basically use something that's high in phosphorus and potassium, but low in nitrogen. If you 
give your, your seedlings too much nitrogen, they're going to grow a lot of fun. Okay, so most of y'all probably aren't going to make your own potting soil, so you can always buy potting soil pre-made, and if you want to grow organically, you need to use an organic potting soil mix if, you, um, if you're going to follow the National Organic Program standards. Um, you basically have to have an organic potting soil makes an organic transplant, and an organic transplant makes an organic plant. So it all starts with your potting soil if you're doing it organically, so it's important to have an organic potting soil. But some things, ingredients you want to look for is you want to make sure that there's a good mix of the perlite or something in that, that potting soil to aerate it, and then something to hold water, and then the right amount of nutrients in there too. Not too much. The plants generally don't need nutrients until they show true leaves, and we'll go into the greenhouse and show you that. So uh, some considerations when you're starting these seeds is different seeds require different temperatures uh, to germinate best. Um, most seeds in general are going to germinate around 77 degrees best. Um, some things like your summer plants, like your peppers, watermelons, tomatoes, they may germinate best at 86 degrees. Um, some things like spinach likes it even cooler. It's not going to germinate unless it's you know 68 degrees. So you can look at different fact sheets online and figure out the ideal temperature for those seeds and make sure you try to provide them a range that's close to what their optimal is. So in your house, um, I find that seeds can germinate well if you have a hot water heater that's a tank water heater. You can place your seed, your seed starting flat or your trays on top of that water heater and that water heater will usually give them the right temperature. You can always put a thermometer there to make sure. If you want a cooler temperature you can move the flat up on some bricks or boards or something to keep it higher or a little further away from your hot water heater. If you need a higher temperature you can bring it down but hot water heaters are kind of an unused resource. If you're start, We start our seeds in our cooler and we put a heater in our cooler and we can dial that heater in to the exact temperature that we need. Some people just do heat lamps in their basement and that works too. Yeah, heat lamps, um, but if you don't have enough sunlight uh, or if you don't have a greenhouse, probably the best place to, to start your transplants is going to be next to a sunny wind window. And if you don't have that six hours of sunlight that you need, you can supplement the light with a fluorescent light or an LED light that's suitable for growing plants. Or just buy them. Buy or your transplants. Buy them, makes it much easier. But I find that starting, you know, plants from seed is one of the most enjoyable parts of gardening. So you don't want to miss out on the most fun part. Especially fun for kids. Yes, yes. So if you're doing it with kids... Um, Sean, I have a question. Yes. How do you decide whether to do transplants, make your own transplants, or buy them, or just plant the seeds in the ground? That is a great question. So some, uh, the question was, you know, uh, when do you choose to do transplants and when do you choose to do direct seeded stuff? So um, some plants or some seeds and some plants like carrot seeds don't do well transplanted. Um, it is possible to grow them as a transplant and transplant them, but they usually do better if you direct seed them. A lot of things need really close spacing like carrots and beets. Beets you can do from transplant, but they require very close spacing like three inches apart. So if you grew them as a transplant, that's basically you're putting in a lot more transplants as opposed to a tomato, which could be spaced two feet apart. It's just a lot more work to put all those transplants in Good there. rule of thumb, do your root vegetables as direct seeds. Yeah. And um, pick growing greens like arugula and stuff like that. Yep, yeah, a lot of things germinate, grow super quick, and don't need radishes, you know, to turnips. be transplanted. Um, yeah, so what do we transplant? We do turnips, radishes, carrots, beets. We direct seed. Direct seed. We're all direct seeded. Um, cilantro. Um, basil is a good one in direct seed, although we do that as transplants. Um, uh, okra, corn, and beans are all direct seeded as well. What about lettuce? Would you ever direct seed lettuce? Um, I don't direct seed lettuce because lettuce needs to be planted very shallowly. And a lot of times when we're planting lettuce, well, that's, a good let that's a good segment into seed depth. So different seeds require different depths when you plant them in the ground. Um, lettuce, for example, likes to, a lot of light and likes to be right on the surface and not buried at all. So if you direct seed that in your garden, you're putting lettuce seeds on the surface and a big rain comes, it's just going to wash those seeds away. 
Um, but in general, you basically plant the seed one and a half at a depth that's one and a half times the width of the seed. So if your seed was really big, one inch, you basically want to put it an inch and a half in the ground. Like it, corn or beans or like, something yeah. like that. Um, if you have these little micro seeds like we're playing right now, these flower seeds or broccoli seeds that are very small, you just want to cover them with, with, with soil that's only one and a half times the width of the seed. So just a very small amount. The most common problem that I see in seed starting is planting seeds too shallow or too deep. That's a recipe for failure. And to help with that, um, I always cover the seeds with vermiculite. Vermiculite is much more forgiving in depth Where do you buy that? than potting soil. You can get this at um, your local feed store. So vermiculite is good in that it absorbs a massive amount of water, even more than vermiculite, so your seeds are going to be less likely to dry out when you're getting them started. But the seeds can also push through this vermiculite much easier than they can push through potting soil. So if you don't get your depth perfect, vermiculite is very forgiving and still allows those seeds to push through. Great. Can you buy that at Home Depot or Lowe's? You think? Yeah, you can get it at Home Depot and Lowe's in like okay. small bags. And it, it doesn't take much. We'll show you how we cover so, yeah, after. We'll show you our covering technique. Okay, so planting depth is important. Temperature is important. Um, and if you're starting these inside, like on top of your hot water heater, you need to check them every day because you don't want those seeds, once those seeds germinate, you need to move them into a high light area. If they stay in that darkness too long, they're gonna get leggy and they're gonna die when you then transfer them later. So it's important to like, you know, if you're starting them in a dark area, to move them and check on them daily or even a couple times a day so you can get them to that area um, as quickly as possible. After <laughs> Joe Rowland commented, Ella wants to know why you're just standing there and when you're gonna grow something. <laughs> <laughs> Soon. We're, we're, we're getting through the process. Yeah. Corey says, What's up, Sean? I like your hat. <laughs> <laughs> Where's that seed just go? Okay. Beverly, right. Beverly asks, Can you also go over the order in which they all go on the outdoor faucet? Oh, the hose, the hose stuff. The irrigation. Or the drip. The drip. Drip. Also, what pressure reducer PSI to use? Okay, the pressure reducer is uh, 30, it depends on the type of drip system you're using. We use drip tape, which is normally used on farms, but the drip system that I was showing you in there with the emitters can tolerate, you know, 30 to 40 PSI. Um, usually you get a, a pressure reducer that's about 30 PSI for that. Okay. Um, and the order would be the converter that goes from hose bib to pipe thread, and then you want your uh, filter, and then your pressure reducer, and then from your pressure reducer, you want to convert to that uh, drip tubing. And then from, and then your drip tubing goes straight to your garden. We'll, we'll send Beverly a, a private message. We'll post it publicly. Or, sorry, we'll, we'll post it publicly. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so Rachel No is, private um, insight. Very carefully making sure that the seeds are not too deep. I don't know if you saw, show them again, the technique. So we just use that small pot with holes in it to... Oh. So you, oh. Don't, so you don't put too much soil those over those feet. seeds. Um, <laughs> I'm going to water. Okay. You want to talk about how to water in things? Yeah, so you basically don't want to disturb that level of soil too much when you water your, your, your seeds in. Sometimes I miss. So, yeah, so if you have a mister setting, that'll get your soil wet and prevent it from moving around. Um, once it's wet, then you can switch over to a shower. And you basically just want to go very light. And it's good to, like, pass, go, go past it in both uh, and from usually from further away. Yep. So you basically just don't want to hold your hose on your flat Sorry, and blast the soil away. And this goes for the same in your garden. If you're watering your garden by hand, usually go past it and sweep side to side um, and try to get everything evenly. And what do you always say? Go, I go three th times longer than you think. <laughs> three times longer than you think is my rule of thumb because you generally don't water enough. Um, if water is starting to like leach out the bottom just slightly, then you've normally watered enough. You want just a small amount of water to leach out the bottom, but not too much. And as Rachel was just showing you, another technique is to just feel and make sure that the flat is heavy, and then you know that it's, that it's got enough moisture in it. So all good techniques to make sure that your plants get water. And what about how often would you water while you're germinating? Um, yeah, so 
you know, generally they might not need water at all for pre-germination if they're inside in a dark area. Um, but it's going to vary depending on the temperature. You know, on top of your hot water heater, they might dry out pretty quickly. So you do want to check on them daily to make sure that they never dry out. You always want the soil to be moist. If it's wet and then it dries out, a lot of times the seeds will die. Okay, so I think we get that you want your seeds to be pretty moist. Yeah, you want your seeds to be moist. And once your seeds germinate and start growing, you these things are going to need water once, twice, three times a day, depending on how hot and how much sunlight they're getting and how big they're getting. As they get bigger and the root system fills out these squares, they're going to need water a lot more frequently than when the transplants are small. If you're feeling overwhelmed by all this information, just go to the farmer's market. We will provide the vegetables for you. But if you do want the info, Sean's going to give it to you. Okay. Should we move on to planting? Okay, let's move on to Wait, planting. Wait, can you leave this thing here now that you've... Or well, does it have now, to go in a dark space? Um, no. Well, if it were... The reason you would start something in a germ chamber is if it were earlier on in the year and it was too cold for that seed. But since we are blessed with basically an 83 degree day, um, if we just put it in our greenhouse, it'll be fine. But for those of us who don't have a greenhouse? Um, like Sean said, a sunny window. With additions of, um, you know, supplemental light is usually needed. Let's, let's go talk about how to put these things into the ground. Okay. Can I wear my hat? Yeah, you can to? use... Um, I have this river as compost. Okay, okay. I just, they were mowing over there, but oh, okay. now they're not. The air is down. Yeah, good call. I don't know if I have enough to cover all of this. So one fun fact here on the farm is that we actually sequester the heat generated from our compost. So underneath this um, horse manure that we got from a neighboring farm is a concrete slab. And then we have PVC pipes that run under here. And that water goes straight past my sister into the greenhouse. So we don't use propane on the farm. Oh, I lost the video. Can you talk about soil formation and composting? Because once you have composting, it helps with the Okay. Can I start loading composting? I guess we can use water. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's do it step by step. Okay, so uh, first talk about soil formation. So what happens is Sorry. So plants make soil. Animals make soil. Um, that's the simplest part of it. So um, what happens is, is we get uh, compost that comes from the city of Chester that's made from leaves. So the cities will typically vacuum the leaves up off the streets because if they let the leaves stay on the streets, the streets will basically eventually turn into fields and then forests. So they constantly are removing the leaves and removing any dirt that gets on the street and um, they vacuum that up, they shred it, and then they compost it. So these municipalities are a great resource to find compost. You can see over there we have leaves that have come from the city of Chester. These leaves are in the process of decomposition and they are basically turning into soil. Um, animal waste like manures over here. This comes from a local horse farm. It's going through the same process. It's mixed with wood shavings, straw, and horse manure. And that's also going to decompose and basically form soil over time. <clears throat> so this soil formation process is important because this quality of soil is going to be much higher than the quality of soil that's in your yard. So the more of this leaf compost or compost that you can add to your soil, the better your garden is going to be. Can you just collect your own leaves? You could also collect your own leaves, um, and you can compost leaves, grass clippings, uh, not dog or cat manure, they don't recommend that, <laughs> but um, Gross. human manure, <laughs> even though you could compost all those things, <laughs> kitchen scraps, leaves, grass clippings are all good things to compost, and what you can do is you can combine kitchen scraps with leaves and grass clippings. And it's always a good idea to basically put the leaves or grass clippings over your kitchen scraps and that way they don't stink. Show us what you do with the compost. Um, okay, but yeah, composting, a great opportunity to create nutrients and create soil for your garden. And reduce your waste. And reduce your waste, yep. 
Um, but one thing to note, if you are composting meat or dairy products, a lot of people don't recommend that. But you can compost those things, you just need to keep animals and rodents out of your compost pile. So they make all kinds of compost containment systems that prevent rodents from getting in there and allow you to compost a broader range of ingredients. But typically leaves, grass clippings, and food waste are going to be the three main ingredients that will make your compost. And if you want a lot of extra compost, go to your city, call your city, find out where they're vacuuming leaves up off the street, um, or if your neighbor has leaves, or if you have leaves, add what those to the compost system. What about weeds? What if you put um, weeds in your garden? Yeah, so some consideration you need to take into account. Leaves usually don't have a lot of weeds in them. Um, grass clippings might have, might have leaves in them, or might have weeds in them. Um, horse manure might have weeds in it, too, in, it, in it as well. Horses don't kill the weed seeds as they go through their digestive tract. Chickens do. So it's kind of dependent on your manure. Cows do process those weed seeds and destroy them, but horses do not. Um, another consideration with animal manures is that some animals eat hay that has herbicides on them, and those herbicides will kill your vegetable plants. They can live in the soil for a very long period of time, up to six years, and you can basically prevent vegetables from growing on your, on your ground if you use manure that has been contaminated with that herbicide. Grass clippings also be contaminated with different herbicides. I would say leaves are probably the most likely to be clear and free of herbicide contamination. But it is an important consideration. So if you do get manure um, and you're using manure in your garden or in your compost system, make sure that you know where the manure came from and what has gone into the hay that fed those animals. Th that's great. Okay. So Rachel is going to demonstrate a technique called sheet mulching. So kind of the old-fashioned way to start a garden. You'd have the sod or lawn or area in your yard where you wanted to convert to vegetables and you'd spend a whole bunch of effort digging that area up and trying to kill all that vegetation with a shovel. How do, you, very how do you even dig this stuff up? It's, it takes a lot of work but, but the technique would be to basically dig it, flip it over so that the grass is uh, the top all leafy part is now on the bottom and the soil is on the top and you might need to do that several times so you're basically flipping it over to block the light and cause this vegetation to die. Ah now I see why people use raised beds. Yeah so raised beds um, same way the raised beds might if you leave them alone eventually seeds are going to get in there and they're going to germinate and grow um, and you're going to be stuck with this situation here. Um, this what we're sitting on right here used to be gravel and over time weeds and plants grew here and um, the vegetation created soil because what happens is, is there's earthworms and organisms in that soil and they're basically coming up and feeding on these plants as they die and as they're feeding on them they're bringing up soil to the surface. Great, cool. So, um, one way we can basically use biology to do the digging for us so we don't have to use a shovel and do a bunch of digging is to basically take cardboard or newspaper and you want to use cardboard or newspaper that is not colored and you also want to make sure that you remove any tape from the cardboard. The tape is uh, not going to decompose like this cardboard. Right. The cardboard will decompose so what we're going to do is we're going to put that down. It's going to block the light so the light can't reach this vegetation. It's going to cause all this vegetation to die. And probably good to mow as low as possible before yep. you put your cardboard down. And if you are gotten your soil tested down here, sprinkle your lime under here before you've added your cardboard. So the cardboard is going to basically block the light and cause all this vegetation to die. It's a good idea to water the ground if it's dry before you put the cardboard down. And also a good idea to water the cardboard. That'll help keep it from blowing away and also start the decomposition process. So what we're going to do here, instead of digging the ground and loosening it up, we're basically going to let the earthworms and all the soil organisms that are already in the ground come up to the surface, feed on this cardboard as it decomposes, feed on all this plant matter as it decomposes and do all that digging for us. This is like, like the lazy way to start a garden. 
However, it does require a lot of compost. So first step, you've tested your soil, you've amended it. Now we're putting cardboard down. And this technique is called sheet mulching. Alternatively, if you don't want to sheet mulch, another easy way to do this is to basically take a piece of black plastic, a piece of plywood, a piece of sheet metal. The first time I did it was I used um, logs and just uh, had a dead tree in my backyard and I cut the logs into three foot sections and rolled them all together. And what that plywood, black plastic, uh, or logs are doing is they're also blocking the light just like this cardboard's doing and you need to leave them in place for, depends on the time of year. In the winter time, you need to leave them in place for several months, six weeks. In the summertime, you can just leave them in place for a couple weeks. And by blocking that light, it'll basically kill all that vegetation. Then you move that plywood, you move those logs, you roll those logs out of the way. Um, you move that sheet metal or plastic or whatever was blocking the light. All that vegetation is dead and you've got the earthworms have loosened the soil because they've come up and eaten all the grass. This is another there. way of just tarping. Mm -hmm. So you could also just use a giant tarp if you would like. Any, any size tarp based on your backyard. So, um... Look yeah, at that posture, yeah. It's a great way, great way to get your... So if you're, if you're, if you're going to put a transplant on this, your potting soil is going to need to be deep enough to support the transplant. Where you water these kids? Water your transplants in before you plant them. What is that? This is bok choy. Okay, so we've got our transplant. Look at those root systems. Very nice. So ideally, the soil or compost is deep enough to support the transplant. You could punch a hole in here but if the cardboard hasn't been in place for several weeks, the vegetation under here may not be dead, and then weeds could come through that hole. Don't worry about the root systems going through the cardboard. Very quickly, this cardboard will decompose, and if the cardboard is wet and you're watering your garden appropriately, the roots will be able to penetrate through that wet cardboard and then enter the soil below it. Okay. No, so if you're using a tarp or plywood, that's a good question, or metal or sheet, anything like that to kill the vegetation, that's called occultation. You're basically just blocking the light like this cardboard is doing, and then moving it out of the way once the vegetation is dead. So in that situation, you definitely want to move it, everything is dead, and then you plant into the actual ground. So that just prevents you from having to bring in all this compost to cover the cardboard and then plant. But if you have the compost resources, might as well use it because this compost is going to make your soil much better by adding all this organic matter to it. Yeah. Let's see you plant that thing. Okay, so once you plant it, basically you just want to pull the soil back, put the transplant in, and then cover it up. So ideally you want the, the root ball here to be slightly covered with soil. The transplant is going to have two different kinds of leaves on it. It's going to have cotyledons and it's going to have true leaves. These cotyledons look a little different you can see than the true leaves. Um, one trick is if the cotyledons are yellowing, then your transplant may not have gotten enough nutrients. Because if your transplant is nutrient poor, it's basically going to be pulling nutrients out of the cotyledons to feed itself. So these cotyledons are called the seed leaves. So when you plant it, you don't want to plant it deeper than these cotyledons, but you do want to slightly cover that root ball of soil. So planting depth is important with seeds, but it's also important with transplants. If your transplant sits up out of the ground like this, then what's gonna happen is it's gonna wick moisture out just like an oil lamp will wick oil up out of the lamp. This is gonna wick moisture out and this transplant is gonna dry out and probably die. If it's too deep, like that would be too deep, a lot of times you can have rot problems around the stem of the plant. Cool. Will you show us some plants that are already in the ground? Well, should we do the seeding, the direct seeding first? Let me water this guy in. Okay. Yeah, you want to talk and then, yes, yeah, always things. water your transplants in after you planted them. And you can create little wells around them if you want to make sure that the water doesn't flow away. So that's good. All right. Let's get the hoe. Okay, we're gonna grab a 
grab a hoe. So now we'll show y'all. I'll show you how to direct seed with the hoe, and then we'll show you how to direct seed with the, the earthway seeder. So if you're direct seeding a plant, grab some beans. I was gonna say, do you have yeah. seeds? Um, you know, the soil doesn't have to be as deep when you're direct seeding it, because you know you don't have to worry about it being the depth of the transplant. So if you're direct seeding, you want to start by making a furrow that the seeds are going to go into. And the depth of this furrow is going to be dependent on the size of the seeds. If you have really big seeds like beans, which are really easy to direct seed, I recommend planting those. If it's your first time, you want to make your furrow slightly deeper. There you go. Okay. So we've got our bean seeds, and then you can basically just roll them off your thumb and put them at the appropriate spacing. So with beans, they recommend one to three inches apart. So once you've got them, well, I would say if you're overplanting planting. early in the season, you usually want to overplant yeah. because it's harder for that to germinate. So it's cooler. If it's not ideal germination, then over. And if your seed is older too, overplant because you're probably going to have less germination. Different seeds will keep and store for different amounts of time. But generally, the older the seed is, the less it's going to, less seed will germinate. And okay. then if it all does, you can just thin it to the correct spacing. Exactly. So then the next step is bearing the seeds. So you just want to carefully bring your hoe in here. And remember, you want the depth to be one and a half times the width of the seed. If it's too shallow, your plants might topple over and not have enough structure to hold upright. If it's too deep, the seeds will rot and they won't germinate. And then, of course, water your garden in once you've planted those seeds. Get them a healthy start. Okay, so now Rachel will show you the earthway seeder. So, I can show you all. so the earthway seeder, let's grab some of those seeds. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you have a large garden, this is definitely a useful tool. It's called an earthway seeder, and what it does is it allows you to put the right amount of seeds out at the right depth. It has different parts to it. This plate right here, or this shoe, basically controls the depth of the seed. And you can see the little number system on the side here from a quarter inch to half inch to up to two inches so depending on how big your seed is you can basically contr very accurately control the depth of those seeds i'll put it if we're going to plant some beans we'll put it at three quarters of an inch okay so this will drop the seeds at the appropriate depth depending on the height of the shoe the chain will cover the seeds and then the back wheel presses those seeds into the ground and then in this cup holder here, you have different seed plates. So this plate is the right size for the bean. It's called the small, or the, it's called the bean plate, bean small peas plate. So we'll insert that. Sean, just for the sake of time, assuming people have a smaller garden, um, since it's already 11.15, should we go ahead and, and check out the cultivation stuff? Okay. Yeah, I'll just finish this real quick. So then running this through your garden, you'll get the seeds planted at the right depth. Great. And the right spacing. So it takes the guesswork out of it. Does a more accurate job than a, than a human can do. So a useful tool. Okay. So we're walking towards our first vegetable field, most of which is in cover crop right now, um, to make sure we don't have any erosion because we had all of our summer crops over here. Um, but you can see we do have some direct seeded crops in the ground with some overhead irrigation set up here. So 
looks like we've got a bunch of carrots um, in the ground here and then some turnips uh, or beets were planted there um, and then over there the bed of clover some old okra that we leave in the ground interplanted with uh, sugar snap peas which will trellis up the old okra because weeds will basically shade out your plants and they'll rob your plants of sunlight, of nutrients, and of water. So by eliminating those weeds, your plants are going to be much more success successful. So the, there's different techniques you can do. Um, we use a flame weeder and this can be done before you plant your seeds. You can basically prepare your bed, let the weeds come up, and then you can flame those weeds with this flame weeder. And you're basically not burning the plants, you're just heating them up so the water inside the cells, water inside the cells expands and causes the plants to die. Um, the weeds to die. Causes the weeds to die. This only works when the weeds are very small, so you want to get them when they're at a stage like this, you know, one inch or so. Okay. Um, why, don't we, why don't we just use a weed killer like Roundup? Um, Roundup can, you know, potentially put, uh, expose genetic. you or, or uh, other people to toxins. So um, it's a useful tool, but uh, in an organic system, it is not allowed. Um, so you can also use a flame weeder post-emergent. So for example, carrot seeds, they take a really long time to germinate. So those carrot seeds might take two weeks to germinate, and the weed seeds might only take one week to germinate, or one and a half weeks to germinate, or even three days to germinate. So when you plant your carrot seeds, um, the weeds will come up before your carrot seeds. So you can plant your carrot seeds, the weeds come up, then you can use the flame weeder to kill those weeds. Your carrot seeds will be protected because they're buried underneath the soil. And um, then when your carrot seeds do germinate, you've already killed the weeds and your carrot seeds will come up, come up with much less weeds. Um, fewer. Uh, much fewer, fewer weeds. So another useful tool is to use a collinear hoe or a stirrup hoe to control the weeds and these tools work best when the weeds are small just like the flame weeder you want to do this when the weeds are about one inch by the time they've gotten to four inches in height the weeds are too large and it's not going to be as effective it's also important to use a collinear hoe or stirrup hoe um, when the soil is going to be, when it's going to be dry for about four hours after you hoe. If, it's, if it rains right after you do this, a lot of times the weeds will have a chance to regrow, especially if it's very cool. Um, but the way this works is you're basically cutting a very lightweight hoe that you keep very sharp, sharp as you can. You sharpen it every time before you use it. And you basically are just dragging it right underneath the soil. And you can see our rows of carrots are spaced so that this hoe fits perfectly between them. And that makes it very easy. And you can reach in and get the end row weeds with this hoe as well. So you can very quickly come through and weed your, your entire garden. Rachel, show us how you do it quickly. I love how Peggy loves. <laughs> we need the hoe again. Yeah, we missed a lot of the... It's important to get the end row weeds. When you hoe, so reach in so, and grab those in row. These look like really interesting cultivation techniques. Thank you. All right. Can we see what it looks like when you've been cultivating um, and it's in a high tunnel and they're a little bit bigger? Yeah, and let's also look at uh, mulching as a technique to control weeds as well. Here's a larger flame weeder that we have from Farmer's Friend. It's really nice. We also have a retention pond on the farm uh, with, with bee hives, um, a nice area to, um, a nice ecosystem for our beneficial insects.
This is our harvest wagon and the nesting bins. And you can kind of see along here, it's all in cover crop that we will um, do some no-till into. Here is some garlic, two beds of garlic. Okay, so another way to control weeds is using um, a mulch. So here we've used this wood chip mulch. And if you use uh, wood chips, it's important not to incorporate till these into the ground um, because as they decompose, they can hold up nitrogen and make nitrogen not available for your plants. But wood chips are perfectly fine on the surface of the soil. And what they do, just like that cardboard blocking the light and preventing things from growing, the wood chips will also block the light and prevent things from growing. So then you don't have to go out there and do as much work controlling the weeds. Oops, sorry. Cool. Another technique for controlling weeds is to cover crop your soil. So in the winter time, instead of leaving your soil bare all through the winter, where weeds can flourish and grow and drop seeds and create more weeds for the next year, we grow this cover crop of cereal rye and crimson clover. And this is gonna protect our soil, prevent it from washing away, as well as the clover is gonna provide nitrogen, a, a major nutrient for our plants. And as all this stuff decomposes, it's gonna break down into nutrients and carbon, which will create organic matter for our soil, which the, the organic matter is in per, in, an important component of your soil because it basically holds moisture and holds nutrients. We love cover crops. Yep, so we love cover cropping. These cover crops help tremendously with weed control. And on a small scale, you can cover crop like this and then lay your cover crop down on the ground and put a tarp over the top of it which will block the light from it and cause your cover like crop that. to die. So it's kind of an easy way to use cover crops in a small garden. You just want to make sure you keep it covered long enough. And then the final way you can see up here is soil crap. Here we had a cover crop but we mowed the cover crop and tilled it into the ground. And you can see it's starting to decompose. Um, so tillage is also another option and you can do this with a rototiller in your garden or you can do it with a shovel um, by basically just chopping it up, things up and turning them over until they die. So it's, it takes a little longer um, than some of the other techniques we showed you. Now we're going into our high tunnel where we have Lots of carrots, interplanted with some cucumbers, um, some beautiful red Russian kale left over from the winter. Oh, you know, I don't even have a harvest And um, down here, we've got a mix of salanova, which is a um, leafy green uh, mix, and some beets, some beautiful beets. Uh, so you can see here's some salanova there and there um, and then cucumbers you can oh <laughs> and we're back, and we're back. Um, we'll answer those questions in just a second um, not very many viewers so viewers right now but we're gonna tell you just a thing or two about harvesting hit it Rachel <laughs> okay great so a thing to consider when you're planting your garden is also how long the crop is going to be in the ground. So for instance, you have crops that are sort of a one-time harvest or you have continuous harvest crops. One-time harvest would be something like harvesting a broccoli head, have, harvesting a cabbage head, pulling out the carrots, pulling out the beets. You also have continuous harvest crops like kale. I don't know if you want to come look at this kale or chard. Um, you could also view crops like arugula or cilantro where you would get multiple cuttings from it. So you would cut it and then it would regrow and you would be able to harvest again. Um, but for kale, for instance, and other crops that are like it, like collards, um, there's a growth point in the center. You want to show them this? So growth point is in the center. So every time you come to harvest, you're going to want to harvest the outermost leaves that are the largest and you can just simply uh, put your thumb on the stem and push down and basically you'll collect your bunch of kale 
Um, the other important thing for harvesting, especially if you're dealing with greens, is that you want to do it when it's cool, so in the morning as early as possible. And vegetables take on what they call field heat. So the sooner that you can get the field heat out of the vegetable. So if I were going to harvest kale, I would pick the bunch that I need and then I'd go inside. I'd probably fill my kitchen sink with some water, put a few ice cubes in it, dunk the kale. The kale has immediately cooled down and that means that it's going to store much longer in the fridge. So always be thinking about how do I harvest when it's cooler, when it's cloudy, um, and then how do I cool down the vegetable as soon as possible. Other thing I wanted to show you was um, in terms of harvesting lettuce, we started growing this new variety called Salanova, which you actually plant as a head lettuce, but you harvest as a loose leaf, and you can get multiple cuttings off of it. So even though the seed is a little expensive, I think it's really worth growing, and uh, there's a lot of farmers out there that really like it. So the way that it works, I 